as I said, I am working with Dreamscape Immersive. I'm the head of production there, so what I handle is mostly the content creation, working with both the creators and directors, and then all the wonderful developers we get a chance to meet and work with. Um, we're located in Westfield Century City right now is our only location. We are opening up more, which I'll talk about. So probably a majority of you have not been to Dreamscape. Are there people out there who have seen it? Few? Oh, wow. Hey, I love that answer. <laughs> you better be raising your hands. <laughs> so um, that's excellent. But I have a video to kick off with. It gives you a little insight to it. For those of you who have been there, you get it. You get that it's a really hard thing to talk about to truly understand what you're going to go through. So hopefully this video will catch a little bit up on that, if I can play this all correct. I just hit a lot of clicks. Yes. <laughs> so I'll get into a lot of details about what you saw, but that should kind of catch you up to we're really an immersive storytelling company focused on entertaining our guests in a shared experience. Whoa, there I am. That is not my presentation. There you go. <laughs> um, let me talk about how we first got started. The vision of this company was to take the Hollywood storytelling, merge it with going through great theme park ride experience along with using this incredible technology that our Swiss partners made. All of this was with the goal to have a shared journey, a shared immersive journey for our users. So what, what happened was Walter Parks and Kevin Wall, two of our co-founders, went to Sundance a few years back and met with Cecilia and Savan from Artinum. And what they created was this, this incredible technology that they initially started using for medical purposes and sports therapy. They saw the goal of what they could do with it and they, the opportunity to take that technology, utilize it in VR, but with the real high level goal of trying to make something that is more shared as opposed to isolating. Kevin Wall and Walter, of course, both saw the technology was so unique, but also had the same vision. So to, instantly that was where the company was born in 2016. So as I talked about our creative leadership, our leadership is really what makes this company special. We have Bruce Vaughn, who is our CEO. He was also from Walt Disney Imagineering and ran Walt Disney Imagineering for opening up parks such as Shanghai Disney was his big one he opened up. After that, he had this crazy vision he was gonna take two years off and sleep and get rest. And then, of course, Walter Parks came knocking at the door about a month into his two-year sabbatical and killed that right away. <laughs> so Walter is our chairman and co-founder. He and his wife, Lori, ran DreamWorks Live Action with Steven Spielberg, so he comes from the big powerhouse storytelling of Hollywood. He has done 50 plus, block, 50 plus blockbuster films, that's kind of hard to say, um, over the years, including the Men in Black series, Men in Black coming out soon, International. That's again one of his, one of his that he has produced. So he really brings in that talent. Our business leadership is Kevin Wall and Aaron Growski. 
they ran Control Room, which was a company that put on such production as Live 8, Live Aid. So what they bring to the table is this incredible experience of putting on major productions and operating it, both in a very guest-pleasing way, but in a, an efficient and value-engineered way, which is important to a business. And then as I talked about, this is our tech leadership from the Geneva side. So these two are um, so incredibly smart. I love when I talk to them. I can't understand half of what they said, but they bring this technology and it is as precise as a Swiss watch. We talk a lot about the technology to conferences like this. We try not to talk about it too much to the public facing because we really want them to focus on the story. But I know a lot of people here are at, at, a, at a place where they want to hear more on the tech side, so I'm going to speak to it a little bit. We are completely untethered. We wear backpacks and headsets, and then we have a 15 by 15 theater that we walk our guests around through an entire story. Our unique side to what we do is full body tracking. We have feet markers, hand markers, head. We are full IK system that tracks with zero latency and to the millimeter of accuracy. That allows our guests to fully buy into the avatar they are and be a part of that story and move around with uh, no nausea, and I am the first to get nauseous, and so if you can't make me sick, then you can't pretty much make anyone. And they test me at work, it's very evil. Um, we came out with three pieces of content this year. We opened up our flagship in December, and we are highlighting these three shows, Curse of the Lost Pearl, we are doing Blue, Deep Rescue, and Alien Zoo. Alien Zoo we had run for a short pop-up in January of last year, but this is our permanent location, so each one of these has its own theater, and you can go in, you buy tickets, and you go to whichever show, and hopefully you buy tickets to all three shows. Oh, this, this slide does not like to move. I think we have to wait for the video. Oh, okay. Um, I talked about our location. Um, I'm gonna talk about how we're theming it, because what we're doing in each location, and we're gonna be opening multiple in 2019, is we're really branding Dreamscape first, because the shows will rotate, so we don't want to theme them in the show experience. We want you to come to Dreamscape, and if you notice, we're really not technology facing in the way we're branding our company. We're talking about Dreamscape as somewhere you go that takes you on adventures. And we purposely went with the old school train look because we didn't want to be intimidating. VR is still to the public something that a lot of people don't understand. If we want people to come in and we want four quadrants, we want to make sure they feel comfortable when they walk in the doors. So you come in and you see we have our departure times, so you can buy tickets to that. And then you go into our departure lounge. We hope you love it and you hang out. We have food and drinks. We're gonna have a liquor license soon. You can come in and have a beer, a glass of wine, hang out with your friends. You go in, you, they call you up. When we have amazing operators also, I must say. They call you up, they take you back. You go through your experience and then you come out and a lot of people come out and they hang for another 30 minutes talking with each other about what they just experienced, and that's really what we want. So here's some more. There you can see our gear up. We tried a lot of different ways to gear people up. We wanted to make sure it was very friendly to the user as they go in. A lot of people, this is the first time they're gonna be touching this. They don't understand it, it's daunting. We wanna make it as friendly as possible. So we seat you down, you put your foot, we have our operators walk you through as you put your foot and hand markers on. You put the backpack on, oops, sorry about that put the backpack on, and then we bring you into the theater. And much like if you were me, we blind you like this on purpose. So they have stage lighting. We don't want to show off what's in the theater. First, we don't want to blow the surprise, but second, it's like Disney. You don't want to show the back of the ride. You want everyone to stay within the ride. So we do that on purpose, and then we put your headsets down, and you're already started on the story. I talk about Westfield a lot, because that's our flagship location, but we are opening up in multiple more locations in 2019. Our next one will be Dallas, that'll open up in a few weeks, and then we have um, Columbus, Ohio, we have New Jersey, and we have Dubai. Westfield was our Series A-led investor, so they're very interested in getting foot traffic within the malls. They, want, they were trying to find new ways to bring people out because we know shopping has become a very strong online presence. They we're quick to get in there, quick to take us and say, we're gonna put you in our most premium malls so we can be a premium experience. And what they have loved about us is that upon polling, 90% of the people coming to Dreamscape came to that mall for Dreamscape. So we are not consuming their foot traffic, we're adding to it, which is huge for us. They um, also wanna know about who is coming to see this. I mean, that's a big question for everybody because you would think it would be the teens and the 20s because they're just the more attracted to this kind of medium. 
our medium age is 32, which is incredible news for us. 32 starts talking about, A, we are hitting a four quadrant group. B, we're talking it's a business. We want the disposable income level. And then they're also buying multiple tickets, more than two tickets per transaction, which tells us families are coming. And we know that even just by observation. Um, last week alone, we had a buyout for about three hours of a 10-year-old birthday party. The parents called, bought every show, and did a 10-year-old birthday party. Two days later, I, I can't use names, but we had a, a TV star influencer come in, and he bought out all of Sunday afternoon. And so we had 30 and 40-year-olds in there. So we're seeing such a great, diverse group. When we say we're four quadrant, we're getting four quadrant. There's 10 to 90 year olds. Uh, I do a lot of hosting at the, at the store where I bring people over from the industry and I take them through a show. I've done the show so many times, I let them go through without me. My favorite thing is to sit back and watch the crowds that came in. The other day there were three 20 some boys you know, dressed in the hoodies, acting like my two teenage boys, pushing each other around, being rough housing. And then an older couple, 60, came in, not related to them, and I thought, I don't know how this is gonna go because these guys are pretty rough, you know, a little foul language, a little wild. They came out high-fiving with the older couple and stood there and talked for 10 minutes after the show. That really speaks to how bonding this experience is. You don't have to go in with friends. You can have the experience with complete strangers and enjoy yourself. Let's see, let's see if we can get off my face and move to something else, okay. We talk a lot about we make immersive stories. So the question is, how do we identify these stories and how are we sure that they're completely the right story for us to make? We have um, a few things that we ask ourselves right up front and we're tough on ourselves because we have to be. This medium won't last if we don't all make quality content. So that's gotta be something we force and push every day. The questions we ask is, are the guests the stars of this experience? It has to be where your guest the six people that go in there together have to be the main characters of this story. On original IP, it's a little bit easier. We are doing licensed IP much, much harder because you're talking about dealing with worlds and characters that the audience is already aware of. So how do you insert them into that world and give them agency and have them affect a story? So that is a really big challenge, but when you crack it and you do it right, we're finding it's an incredible experience. The other question is, can this only be done in VR? This is a medium that mandates, don't just do it because you can, do it because it mandates being in that medium. It's like any good filmmaking and story making. Use the medium that mandates it. The next question we say, would I like to do X in VR? Meaning, am I excited to go in and be, do a deep dive and save a whale? Of course I am. Do I wanna go into an Indiana Jones adventure? If it's mundane and you're not excited to say that sentence, we should probably pass on that idea. Do we give our audience something to do and not just see? This is not a passive storytelling experience. If we're passive, we're, we're doing it wrong. And we go through that constantly on all of the stuff that's in development, on all the product we've made, and then in development, I guarantee along the way we rip it apart and restart the storytelling because we realize we have to push ourselves that way. Uh, the other thing is it has to be a multiplayer, multiplayer experience. This is six people, you want them all doing something together. Don't just give one person a great experience, give all six that excellent experience. And then we know if we do those top five, we're gonna make a mind-blowing experience. It's gonna be something you have never done. All right, so we get a lot of pitches that come in. We both have internal, external pitches, and we work with license. We're open to all of that as far as making content. But we have some critical ways of doing filmmaking. I come from 20 plus years of producing animated films prior. The most important thing when you're coming up with a film is define your world rules. Once you know internally what the rules of that world are, don't break it because your audience will suspend disbelief if you give them the rules of that world and stick within it. The second you break it, even in a minor way, they're gonna notice that. One of the critical parts for us is the avatars. The avatars have to fit within the world. That is absolute, so we do not do uh, photogrammetry of the world because our avatars don't look like they live in the photogrammetry world. We've got to keep that consistent. It doesn't mean we never will do it, but in the moment we have to make sure everything works. You need a wow moment up front. That's something we learned really early on, especially on Alien Zoo. We'd had the petting of the, so I'm gonna give away some secrets for those who haven't been there, sorry. You, you go up, Alien Zoo is where you take this elevator up to a floating zoo where endangered species of alien animals are being kept to keep them safe, of course. So you get up there and the doors open on the elevator 
you get hit with the smell of this great vista. You're looking a seven mile vista out in front of you with all these wonderful animals. And one animal comes up to you and you reach out and you virtually pet it, but at the same time, we have a physical haptic of, uh, uh, it's called a trunk horse. It's trunk horse's face that you actually pet. Everybody goes, whoa, they all pet it. We put two of them in there so six people could do it and everyone goes, I just now get this. I am gonna have a whole different experience. From that moment on, everybody's reaching and grabbing and doing that. We talked about in the first early days, we had that moment much later on, and so people stayed static and they stayed back and they didn't release their brain to say, this is different. So do that wow moment up front. Make sure they understand you're free to roam. We use haptics, physical haptics, in our storytelling. It gives us so much life. Your senses need to be a part of this experience because, again, you're not watching something, you're experiencing it. So the wow moments, or just the entire story, we use touch, smell, wind, up kickers, um, they're missing water. We also have water, we'll spray you with a little bit of water sometimes, so don't worry, not too bad, but uh, that all gives you, we all know that when you remember something, you walk past a smell and it triggers a memory of something you went through. All of your senses are so vital to creating an experience that is truly something you went through. The other really important part is create empathy. Action isn't enough, you have to have empathy for your characters and the other guests. Empathy is your intrinsic understanding of what other people's feelings are. Sympathy is compassionate for that, but empathy, you're in it with them. So we're already putting you in a situation from the get-go that helps you create empathy because none of you have done this before. So this is, when you walk in there with five other people, this is all of your first experience at doing this. Um, we do a couple other things, we play with your emotions. We're not doing jump scares, this is really family friendly, but we do create dangerous situations, things you have to get through to get out, we create joyous moments, we create tension, and then we give you instant relief after that, of that tension, so you have that moment of uh, uh, screaming and pausing together, and I'm gonna play a fun video and you can hear it a little bit later. And then we wanna leave you on an emotional high. This is a lot to take in. It's a 10 minute story, we're giving you information, we're blowing your senses, so you can't get too meta on the story. You have to be careful about that. And people want to walk away feeling really good. So that last moment of woo, where you scream out, is what you want. So marketing. As much as I started this saying this is really hard to describe unless you go through it, our marketing team has the biggest and hardest challenge, if you ask me, because you're talking about educating the public who generally don't know what VR is about VR, about this kind of VR, and telling them it's different from something they didn't even know. Right up front, it's difficult. We're also really localized in our marketing because right now we're in Westfield Century City. We do a lot of press that gets out to the community that's really the tech community and the VR community, but we're, we're staying very local because that's how people are coming to get the tickets. We use a lot of social, and we do unpaid social and unpaid media. We have get the word of mouth out just where is that person? We get the word of mouth out just by influencers coming. We'll host influencers night, but we don't pay them. They do the word and talking all on their own, which is excellent for us. We have a really good social team back at headquarters who are constantly putting things out on Insta and Facebook. We get a lot of, lot of pictures posted and hashtagged, which has been great for us. Um, I'm gonna play this video that talks a little bit about getting the word out. So we're not kidding when we, when that wasn't made up, that wasn't us staging anything, we didn't have fake screams, that happens. To the point of we're actually next to Del Frisco's Steakhouse and that experience is the one that most people scream. We actually had to move that theater to the other side to annoy the clothing store and not the Del Frisco steak people. <laughs> they were not enjoying eating their steak while hearing screams and thumps. <laughs> Noise pollution can be an issue. <laughs> But that's a real reaction. Last two weeks ago, I was at a convention um, and we were running this constantly for some people. And I've never spent 12 hours, three days in a row, watching people go through one experience. I mean, and we're not, this was not a tech convention. I unfortunately can't tell you what it was, but um, this was people mostly East Coast based and they were there and they don't know anything about VR. They don't, they've never done any of it. 
I've heard, never heard more buttoned up suit men swearing and screaming and having a great time <laughs> than this group. It's crazy the reactions we get from all of this. And that's how we keep going. So that's, you know, you listen to people describe it as they come out, that kid went through that. He wasn't telling you a movie he saw, he told you what he did. That's why we love that clip. And again, he wasn't a paid actor, he was someone we just caught people as they walked out and talked about it. I think this is actually the last slide. Sorry, if you could just watch the truck, the, the mega wrap walk across. So that's mostly what I was gonna talk about today. Um, I know we don't have tons of time. I could take any questions if you have them or I am gonna be outside if I could answer questions for people. But does anyone have anything specific? Because I can't see a single person out there. I'm blinded right now by lights. <laughs> I would say it is a good budget, it is very small. I am in charge of that budget. You don't get to know that budget, but I do. Um, actually, we do. I do know that we make these for very incredibly low price compared to um, some of the other metrics I've seen outside. Yes? So how do you uh, compare and contrast to the void? How do I, oh, compare, okay, how do we compare and contrast to the void? We love all LBE VR. There, we need a hunger for it the, for everybody. So first off, we never use the word competitor with them. We want them to be successful and great as well. The differentiating factor that we took on for Dreamscape was to brand ourselves as immersive storytelling. The Void has story, but we don't do first person shooter. We'll never do first person shooter. We don't do gaming. There's a lot of great work out there that does that. So good, go get it, enjoy it. But what we're doing is storytelling and then we're full body tracking. So that's something that's not out there with anyone else right now. Yes? Yeah, Dubai is going to be um, 2019. MAF is one of our investors, and so they're very interested in getting us in the Mall of Emirates. Um, we're going to be right next to the Apple Store and opening up, but they, they're very strategic investors as well. Lots of people who own malls, we're talking to all the countries, all the malls, they all want that. So we're just really being cautious and going into the highest foot traffic in the malls, um, the highest foot traffic malls and premium ones where they've invested and redone a lot of work to them to make them more centers of experiences as opposed to just shopping. And then same with AMC. AMC led Series B funding and so they are very interested in getting foot traffic because they realize movies are, are a challenge right now to get people to the theater. So they're actually giving us theaters where we have internal and external entrances so that, and then they're, they're helping run that and that for us is great. Anything else? I have no idea. Okay, I can, okay. Um, I don't, I, I don't know that. I know for a while we were getting a 20% repeat rate, but I know it's gone up. I mean, I, I don't have that specific met answer or data, but we get a lot of it. I was sitting next to this 80 year old man with what was clearly his grandson and he was telling him everything. I mean, someone, Joanna hired this guy because this kid was telling him how headsets work in the deepest detail of technology that I didn't even understand. And he was like 10. It was shocking. But he was like, I've done this one four times. I've done that one three times. Like, it's crazy. What I've learned is nobody goes to work or school in LA because <laughs> the fact that we're 80% plus utilization rate from the day we opened and we haven't dipped below that in LA during the rain, during the week, when it's below 70. That's just nuts. And we're an outdoor mall, so it's pouring rain and we're still getting an 80% utilization rate. We're selling out on weekends. You can't get tickets most weekends. All right. Okay, I think that's it, because it says I only have like one minute left and I know I can't see the man in the back that was gonna tell me to leave the stage. So I'm just gonna leave. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Um, our 2020 slate to open up, we have not announced. I don't know what the press announcement plans are. We have those identified and we're already in um, talks with Westfield AMC's other locations about which ones we are picking. So we're looking at the inline spaces, but they'll do a big press announcement on that. Okay, cool, thanks everyone. <laughs>